What's up, guys? Welcome back to Title Gardens. I am in Dallas, Texas, and I am here for the Aquashella show. However, I am very excited to finally get back to Dallas because my friend Ryan, I've showcased his aquarium once before in this channel, and it is easily the largest aquarium that we've talked about. And we've I've been trying to get back here to do an update on his tank. However, uh, global pandemic issues and all. So I wasn't able to, it took a couple years, but I'm finally back. So thank you very much for having me back over, Ryan. Absolutely, it's great seeing you. I'm glad uh, you tolerated all those nose swabbings we gave you. <laughs> Gotta be safe, right? So let's just talk about the tank real quick. Can you just give the listeners an overview of what we're looking at here? What's the size of it? How long it's been running? So this is a tank that's been up for five years. The aquarium is a thousand gallons and it was primarily set up to be a SPS dominant aquarium system. So I, as you can tell, don't have that much livestock really for nitrates and phosphate control and nutrients as a whole. Um, the primary aspect of the, having fish is really more of a fertilizer concept of making sure that uh, the corals were fed. It's is set up for one main purpose, and that's really to kind of be a vibrant, large-scale system with uh, large SPS corals. I think on that front, you're definitely mega successful because these colonies are absolutely gigantic. Sometimes it's hard to get a, an idea of scale when people are looking at this tank, but it measures easily, what, 10 feet by 5 feet? Exactly. That's the footprint of it. And I think I remember it's a little over 32 inches tall which is makes, I'm sure it makes it an adventure to, to get to the stuff towards the bottom of the tank. Yep, could be worse. Seemed like a good idea at the time, but uh, 30 would definitely be a little better. Yeah, I, actually, like um, my, my, my biggest aquariums at my place are 24 inches deep and they look shallow, but it's because of the size of the tank. And I struggle to get my arm to the bottom of 24. So I can't imagine like 35, 36, uh, inch deep aquariums. That sounds like, I, and I have long arms too. Like people think that I'm short, but I, I'm really not. I have long arms and it's very difficult to get to the bottom, but you, you make it work clearly. Um, you, so you would next time, if you were to do another aquarium, let's just say, because everybody wants to do more aquariums for some reason, um, would you go shorter than the 30 plus? Well, the primary reason why we did the dimensions like we did were actually the aesthetics of the wall. So the house is set up where it's built on an indoor outdoor perspective and um, the the back windows are actually a big door wall. So that opens up and uh, it, it, there's an entrance into the backyard so that sort of scales appropriately. So the interior decorator was a little opposed to 30 inches tall because it would actually change the aesthetics of that, that her, I guess, a portion of what she looked at her vision, right? The system is obviously my vision, but how she looked at it from a design perspective. I hate to say it, but the deeper tanks do just look better. Yeah. And the other thing that I've noticed is that fish behave differently in deeper aquariums, like top to bottom. I've noticed that in, in some of the really shallow aquariums, they are a lot more skittish. And once you have them in a much deeper aquarium, they just chill right out. So yeah, maybe that that, that is the sweet spot, even though it's kind of like a little maintenance <laughs> hurdle occasionally. We all hate wet armpits. <laughs> exactly. So you said it, you've been running this aquarium for five years now. Uh, so all of these colonies, did you start off with frags? How did that go about? Yeah, so the system was always set up with, with all frags, um, one to one and a half inch frags. Um, you know, I always tell my kids that uh, failure is the best lesson uh, in life, right? Without failure, you never really realize your successes. Uh, as everyone probably knows that's, that's knee deep in the hobby is that um, although it's supposed to be a very relaxing hobby, it can be quite stressful at times. And although you can look at it in all its grandeur, and it and it really, it's an impressive system, but uh, it, it's not without its failures. I've had uh, uh, some, some losses here and there, and every single coral that I set up in the system is not still with me. Um, but the, um, the, the, it's a law of attrition, 
and the, the strongest survive and the corals that are in there are really just very robust. Yeah, and I th and I can splice in some images for uh, for the audience to kind of uh, illustrate what the tank looked like two years ago versus now. Because I, 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 I noticed that a lot of the, the colonies are much, much larger. And I guess that's kind of the, the frustrating thing about keeping so many acros is that Acropora can just one day decide to just kick the bucket. And you have this what looks like probably a 24 inch wide colony suddenly just decide, oh, it's time to go now. At that point, yeah, the, the other colony just kind of like fill in for it. But yeah, like things can get testy occasionally. And I remember um, off camera, we were talking about how uh, at one time you had something like 40% more diversity between uh, the last time that I was here and now. and just thinking about what that might have looked like because right now it doesn't look like there's like an open spot in the tank on the rock work at all. Yeah, so when I initially set the system up, I looked at what type of corals I was going to be putting in and I wanted to have a visualistic perspective of the future of those corals within that tank in space. You know, knowing what corals were gonna table, knowing what corals were gonna be more bushy and combrios, um, I tried to put those corals in the aspect of trying to minimize any shading, uh, any flow voids and things that, yeah, you're gonna inadvertently get over time. And I've always really hated sort of the uh, tanks that have a thousand corals that are all planted together and it's, you know, maybe you've, you've had them in there for six months and so they're about four inches and it's all compact and it's just sort of this palette of just splash of colors. Sometimes the beauty of the corals are actually their growth patterns. And if you don't have a full colony to really appreciate that, I can't say that I'm entirely too sad about, you know, losing some of the colonies just from a space issue. However, the primary intent to set up the corals were actually to space them to grow out and allow them to sort of fill in that negative space, but also while creating negative space to begin with. That's actually kind of interesting because I think that uh, one trend in the industry, by the way, uh, Ryan has been in the hobby for probably over 30 years. I actually started with saltwater with a uh, with a uh, five gallon that went to a 10 gallon a week to a 30 gallon tank in, in a month and I stayed there for a bit of time uh, in 1997. <laughs> That's that, It's been a while, it's been a while. So one thing that's changed somewhat recently within the last I'd say five to ten years is that pretty much all the all the images you see online of coral are of frags and people don't exactly get an idea of what full colonies even look like to even have that ability to plan out large colonies eventually to, to fill out an aquascape so yeah, this video could actually serve as some guideline because here you can see absolutely gigantic colonies and you can actually really appreciate those growth forms. Now, let's dive into a couple of the more like nuanced details of growing coral. I'm sure that a lot of people are going to be really interested in um, kind of the, the, the design philosophy on the husbandry end of things. So let's just start like just go down the list. Uh, protein skimmer? I've had successful tanks without any protein skimming in the past. So your experience can bias you. Obviously a system this big, you're gonna want to have protein skimming. And I actually have a custom skimmer that actually was built for a, it's probably about a 3000 gallon aquarium, but uh, um, it's a trigger systems custom one off. Okay. So is there anything else that you're relying on for nutrient control? Uh, any Anything like bio pellets or anything like that, or just live rock and stuff? No, I, I followed that trend for a bit of times, but I, I don't I don't do any roa foss. I don't do any bio pellets, uh, a lot of live rock, and a lot of water polishing in terms of water changes. But again, I've got 10 fish. I mean, how many people listening to this have 10 fish? A lot, right? Yes, some of them are large, and the largest 
the largest fish in the system is eight to 10 inches and, and as fat as of any filet on the market, but- The big sailfin? Yeah. You know, if you, if you hadn't have said it, I would have thought that there's way more fish in there than 10. I'm probably wrong, but not by a scale of, of much, right? Or are we not counting the damsels or something? <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you look at a system that is a thousand gallons, most people are fish people in, in our hobby. Not all of us, but you're going to think, oh my God, I can have, you know, a start at like 50 fish, you know, or hundred fish. And, and there's a lot to be said about that kind of movement. And that's very graceful and a beautiful centerpiece to your house. But I want coral and I want my coral to, to look as pretty as it can with relatively minimal effort. I mean, you have to, you, there's no, there's no free lunch in this hobby. But I don't want to have to worry about checking my nitrates and, you know, wow, I got them down to 10 and, oh man, they're back up to 40, you know, and have to worry about that. So what do you keep your nitrates and phosphates at in this tank? So it's not like I keep them at anything. It's just where they tend to be. So they're typically around four, five, six. On the nitrate side? On the nitrate side. And the phosphate? And phosphates are usually undetectable to like 0.2. Okay, so the, the system's pretty darn low nutrient. Oh yeah. Do you, do you worry that, that when it's getting pretty much undetectable on both that you might be starving out such large colonies of acros and stuff? I do. As they've gotten bigger, I've thought about that a little bit more. You know, you really notice a subtle change. I can tell when I'll have some variable elemental deficiency. And when you add it and those corals are starved for that, that you will see a robust response in the growth and or coloration of those corals. Okay. Interesting. We really don't run a whole bunch of systems at undetectable. It's almost better for us to have like high nitrate and high phosphate rather than like zeros, right? So it's interesting to, to hear that like you can go from from practically undetectable to low and and notice an, a, a, a physical change in the corals like pretty much immediately. The levels that I quoted were really kind of over a course of time. It's not like it'll go from one level to sort of undetectable. You know, I'd like to keep it around five. I think that's a really easy, safe level um, where you're you're assuredly supplying enough nitrates for those the demands of those animals, but it's not high enough where you're gonna get into troubles and have nuisance algaes and, and other strange things occur. And the, the devils in the details here, you guys that, that are listening, uh, it is really, really challenging to nail down these really, really precise figures, especially when you're talking about a very dynamic system where a lot of biomass is is constantly growing. I mean, these colonies, you can see, are very, very large, and they throw off chemical balances all the time. On that point, calcium and alkalinity, uh, what are we looking at? What, what do you do to supplement that? And um, have you had any issues with trying to keep that those metrics balanced so i run a geo calcium reactor i like to keep my alkalinity around eight and a half it's certainly ranged anywhere from a low of six uh to you know a high of like 10 11. the, the reactor is actually really rock solid the challenge of the reactor is the intrinsic problems that can occur over the course of time and the attention to the details of those problems i have had issues like everyone else has with the calcium reactor of running out of CO2. I've had seal leaks off of the connection between the solenoid and the actual calcium, <laughs> the, the CO2 container. I've had uh, the actual CO2 air hose that goes to the reactor get stuck underneath my water vat and, and uh, yeah, uh, basically strangle the CO2 into the reactor rendering the CO2 reactor, rendering the calcium reactor uh, basically useless. Um, and then, um, you know, you're dealing with the balance of the demands of the corals and how much you're melting, uh, uh, how much reactor media you're melting. Um, so, you know, swings and alkalinity affect all of us. And the diligence is really the key to that. Um, y you can you can tell if by just by looking at the corals, if they're not 
perfectly happy. There's always that canary in the gold mine. And some corals that are a little bit more sensitive to, to uh, subtle changes than others. You know, calcium, I don't really test that often. Um, if anything, and again, calcium reactor for supplementation. Um, and uh, I like to keep my calcium, uh, you know, 420, 460. But, uh, you know, sometimes I'll check it and it's 400 and I'll have to dose. I'll use calcium chloride um, manually to dose. And I'll use baking soda um, manually to dose. And uh, that's pretty simple. So a calcium reactor is doing the bulk of the heavy lifting then. That's really, really crazy because um, I think sometimes we struggle. Man, I, I need, maybe I need to rethink my systems because I use calcium reactors as well. And I would say that the total volume of the system might be a little bit bigger, but I think that your coral density is way more than in the, some of our grow outs. And I, I always got the impression that our calcium reactor, which is also geo, was kind of like struggling to keep up. So yeah, it, it's pretty wild to hear that uh, your single calcium reactor does keep up with the demands of a system that's this packed. Uh, yeah, because we we have to to we use quite a little bit of the two part dosing, especially on the alkalinity side, to keep things you know where we like it. So yeah, it's very very interesting. So I'm going to give a disclaimer alert that I wouldn't recommend this to anyone, but this is what I do. Again, disclaimer: this is from 30 years of experience and uh, kind of getting a feel for how how the systems work. Possibly one of the reasons why that works for me is. I blast a bunch of CO2 in the reactor. I do not monitor the reactor pH, and I do not check the effluent alkalinity. Um, those are all kind of um, discouraged highly, uh, and I'm not recommending that. But I also do that because I understand roughly what the pH is going to be based upon my CO2 bubble count, just from running reactors over the course of decades. So. I'm comfortable with that, and I can kind of chase those numbers in the system. I mean, the tank's a thousand gallons. My sump is, I think, 600 gallons full, maybe. Um, and uh, so you're probably talking about another 300 gallons of water. I have a frag tank that's 50 gallons and then another one that's 100 gallons, right? So you're talking a lot, a lot of water volume. So that's not going to swing very quickly on you. So when I when I start this, I'm like, okay, well, how can I make this the easiest for me? And and I just kind of set that up, and I'm like, I don't want to have to clean more probes, and I don't want to have another another thing to check, and um, and 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 I've made some adjustments, and I do melt through reactor media pretty quick, and I do go through uh, my fair share of CO2 bottles, but. You know, it keeps up and I couldn't be happier with that product. So when you're talking about blasting CO2 through the reactor, like what, what kind of bubble counts are we talking about? Are we like one a second? Yeah, definitely one a second. I've I've had a little faster, but not much. Um, and then the slowest rate is about re a bubble every two seconds. Okay. Yeah, so you're absolutely just trying to melt the heck out of that media. And um, when I say blast, it's really kind of the flow. So I'm really running a lot of flow into the reactor. So I have a manifold and I have a feed line into my reactor. Uh, the only problem with it is the reactor is not really designed to be pressurized. Mm -hmm. So I, <laughs> I reluctantly change new media in there because it's always going to be like a day and a half of kind of tinkering to get the thing not to leak. The output um, is designed with just um, a, a standard RO tubing, but then I dilate that out into three quarter tubing into my sump. So I have a direct, literally not a drip line, but a direct flow out of the reactor. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, it's, which is uh, again not rea not recommended. That's the way I do things, and and yeah, that's the problem with the hobby is if uh, someone sees a great tank and you know it, it's like, what's your secret? Well, I add you know, two drops of, of chicken juice into my system. And then like everyone on the line starts uh, adding chicken juice. <laughs> I could just imagine somebody's just gonna milkshake their tank right. tonight. So if you're gonna run a CO2 reactor, I highly recommend that. And you can be very successful with it because it provides a lot of stability and it's relatively easy once you get it set up. You just have to kind of know what to pay attention to. So let's move on to the next topic. Lighting, what do you have going on over the top of this tank? 
I have the Gen 4 Ecotex and I am super happy with them. This system has only had those lights. Their workhorses haven't had any issues with them. And what kind of color spectrum do you shoot for? Is is it running off of a, a custom program that you put together or one of their presets? What do you have I, going on? I use their preset, the, the Coral AB+. Plus. The AB+, Plus preset. Okay, very popular one. And during the midday, it's not super daylight colored, but it's a good amount of white in there. And then it tapers back down into the into the blues towards the evening. Yeah, there's three solar tubes in that room. Actually four, but three over the tank and they do supply supplemental lighting although some of the fixtures do obstruct some of that you can clearly see a spotlight effect at certain times of the year and that has not had any adverse issues with bleaching corals algae growth or anything like that so you see a neat kind of shimmer and almost like an enhancement of color like a really bright shimmer filter that that happens I primarily see that in the height of summer. Okay. Now, do you ever run a light meter through this thing and trying to get an idea of par values and whatnot? Yeah, I've gone through and checked the pars. I haven't done that in quite some time, but the pars range from 500 at the top to about 250 at its lowest, two, maybe actually 200. There are some pockets that definitely have uh, par values about 150, 175. When I put together the, the idea of the tank was to have kind of this euphelia garden on the uh, the far, the right side of the tank and uh, the side panel. Some folks, this is a good, nice, neat, neat little transition to the next topic. Some folks are of the belief that flow is even more important than lighting. Do you buy into that? I do. I, I and And it took me a while to kind of get to that philosophical mindset but I took a trip to Bora Bora around 2005 and we took kayaks out to the break and the break was basically the area of dead reef that separates the lagoon that's as shallow as like five feet to the wall drop off and that's as deep as a hundred something feet of water and there's about a 20 feet ledge that you can walk on and there's corals. One of the coolest experiences of my life. But the lesson that I took away from that was the amount of flow that those corals that actually were growing on the surface of that area were getting, the tiny little aquarium sized corals. And at that time I'd been in the hobby for a decade. I went home thinking, God, you know, our aquariums, you know, we can't possibly have that much flow ever in a system and so this system was set up specifically to have just as much flow as I could possibly get so how did I do that two pumps for redundancy so I use the abyss 400 and the abyss 200 and I have uh, standard pen ductors two static returns on the far end that are actually hooked up to the 400 I have now that 400 feeds the random flow generator um, and the returns in the back. Um, but I have a, a hundred gallon, <laughs> I have a hundred gallon tank that's actually in this attic space above the tank that I set up as a surge system with a um, with an actuated ball valve. And there's two reasons why I didn't set that up. Practically, um, just petrified of like a massive water disaster and leakage. Uh, it's kind of sad that you I put all this money and I still have never used it. And maybe one day we can add the, to that flow um, and see kind of how that system runs. But um, that's a very old school thing. No, oh, nobody totally. Nobody does this anymore. Nobody has like Carlson surge devices and things like that. This is this is like an early 90s era mindset. Well, the actuated ball valve would allow me to completely rid the system of any sort of splashing and, and, and air bubbles. And uh, then you just get that surge of flow. There's definitely a, a, a biologic need for that with these organisms. I have the largest size mech spec gyres, and I have those actually running perpendicular to the, the, uh, the aquarium in all four corners. And what that does is basically create a big whirlpool. And, um, the amount of flow is quite impressive and the fish absolutely love it. 
that if you turn that off, they will swim on their merry way. If you turn that on, they will hang out and play on it like it's a treadmill. So they need that flow and your corals need that too. I mean, that's their respiration. Mark Levinson just sent me a text yesterday that Abyss is putting out this new massive pump. And it's a lot like that German Pantaray. Yeah, so it's it looks a lot, you know, design perspective with that, but like the energy consumption is insanely low. It's like, it's like 20 watts max or something. Yeah, I'm definitely going to get that because I was going to replace my two MP60s. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually interested in this new Abyss pump. Um, I'm a big, big fan of Abyss and their pumps. And they made a, a massive public aquarium powerhead before that was the size of like a small puppy and is really meant for like basically a gigantic shark system or something and so they made a quote-unquote smaller one <laughs> that's made for tanks pretty much the size of ryan's anything less than that it might not be a great fit <laughs> like 500 gallons might be the absolute minimum size tank for this thing it's still very public aquarium focused but i think it might just hit your sweet spot as far as um the type of reliability and power and consumption that consumption that you're looking for and if you're already looking to like um, rotate out some of your your power heads already yeah let's, let's say maybe a couple of these is just right up your alley yeah definitely I and mean, you essentially if you if you look at it and it let's say it's two grand i don't i have no idea what the cost is could be five thousand dollars i think it's like i think it's like 2700 <laughs> oh yeah oh, okay so that's so i mean that's not cheap but when you look at the cost of a whole bunch of mp60s cumulatively it's in the ballpark and it does actually more than the sum of those. Now, now you can spread your flow out, obviously, right. for that cost, but nonetheless. That's actually one of the reasons why I did decide to do that big surge system because the actuated ball valve is 350 bucks. Um, the tank, you know, you get acrylic tank made, and then you, you're basically talking about using the cost of electricity to push water. So it, in, in the amount of water you can move is technically cheaper. Right. And so the head the head pressure on those abyss pumps, those things do amazing things. They ignore head pretty much. Yeah, right. Guess. And so it's not going to really kind of add your to your demand electrically by just opening up one two inch inch and a half, two inch pipe to feed. Actually I think I have like an inch pipe to feed that uh that that, that system. So just have to be really careful with a lot of redundancy on redundancy in case that sucker gets plugged, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So what could go wrong? Yeah, right. What could go wrong when you're talking about with water in your living room? <laughs> One really cool thing about this setup is that you have a dedicated room essentially behind the aquarium where you can do a lot of your maintenance and stuff. And right off the bat, there's three other aquariums. So can you walk me through what these are all about? What, what are the, the, are they plumbed together? And kind of like, what is the goal for each one? So the orphan tank is actually my friend's system. Uh, he had a life change event and um, had a bunch of high-end corals on it, in it, and he uh, he was gonna sell a system, and I wouldn't let him. So I took the, the orphan in to the house. And, is this the big one that's on the yeah? So this is the, right as yeah, soon as you so walk this, in. This is a a separate system, separate filtration, and uh, a yeah. bunch of fish. So so he basically. Um, just wants the tank back. My plans are to take out my 25 year old Pavona rock, my uh, decade plus boulder of Superman monopora, and the, the large uh, ectoplasm acropora, which is probably acropora austera, uh, and, and some of the euphelia and anacorna, um, and move those into a friend's tank. So I'm I'm going to create space and then I'm going to take all the aquascaping from this system and set it up so the side panel of the aquarium actually is just like the same uh, same view of this aquarium. So the dimensions are the same. It's, it's a five foot long aquarium. This is a five foot side panel. Which is kind of crazy to think that the side panel to the aquarium is a f effectively a five foot show tank. <laughs> This, yeah. That's a side profile, yeah. and and then uh, and then all those fish are going to actually go into the system. Is now that these corals are so big, it's going to be able to accommodate a much 
larger load of of fish. I don't think anybody is going to doubt the, that the tank can handle the extra fish capacity. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I guess the real only issue is, is will they get along, right? So that's kind of on the to-do list. That's a big, that's going to be a big job. Um, but so ultimately that tank should not be here. Next time you come to town, that, that space will be open. What I do with it, we'll see. So the other two tanks are basically four frag tanks. Um, I have a small little Vlamengi tang that um, I want to put in the display. He, um, I got him as a, a small juvenile tang that was maybe uh, an inch. He was an inch long, and now he's about eight inches long. So you know those those fish grow rather quickly. Um, and uh, and I've and I've contemplated on actually just shutting down that, taking that that part of the aquarium offline temporarily, um, just to manage aspects of humidity and, and evaporation. The room's not that bad, um, but I do have a designated geothermal cooling system. Uh, well, the whole house is geothermal, but I have a designated well for that room. And and uh, we've already gone through and replaced that, that unit once. So, um, you know, I expected some of that, um, but I didn't expect to replace it in five years. And that is a very costly error if you want to call it an error interesting i also noticed uh that you have an air exchanger in that same room yeah. are you running that currently i'm not you know the the idea was great and uh here in in dallas it primarily is on average about a 60 percent humidity so the air exchanger actually does not work for an aquarium room when you have you know, the idea is to actually use as a dehumidifier. And if your humidity outside is anything more than 50%, you don't want that thing on. I'm running into the same issue at my place because I've got four air exchangers. And I've learned that Ohio is basically Florida, that it is always 100% humid or something. And if these things are running full blast, it is going to be unbearably gross inside i'll be growing black mold instantly oh yeah it, it seemed it seemed like a great idea on paper didn't it oh it seemed like the best idea. It, it seemed you thought you were like the uh fish room einstein yeah the biggest brain it's like oh yeah. never mind yeah <laughs> but it one thing though that it is nice if you run it on the lowest setting it effectively is bringing just enough fresh air in that your ph issues just go away that, that is that's true. the one nice thing that is true yeah so the idea was for both of those aspects but it uh made my AC run more yeah. to try to dehumidify it. And I think, don't tell my wife, but I think that's the reason why. Yeah. Well, we can always blame it on that, but. <laughs> All right, guys, that pretty much does it for our latest visit and update on this system. Uh, it's been on, it's been a couple years since, uh, that since I've seen it and I'm looking forward to checking out it in the future. Um, again, Ryan, thanks so much for having me over guys in the comments. Let let me know if you guys have any questions and, and and we've covered a lot of topics and if we if we miss something or so there's something that you're curious about uh yeah by all means go ahead and ask it in the comments below and no don't ask how much it costs it's, it's basically free <laughs> all right guys we will see you next time thanks again <laughs>